Our second scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Paul's, another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be empty of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The question has been asked, why can't we all just get along? And I think it's a reasonable question, especially when we consider that we, in the body of Christ, are Christians. You know the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. If we are followers of Christ, then yes, we should be united. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul addresses this and a host of other issues. You see, he's writing to a dysfunctional church. This is a church with many problems. The people in the church are arguing over issues like whether they can eat food that has been sacrificed to idols, or whether a man can marry his stepmother if his father was married to her before and he, his father had died, or how they might employ the gifts of the Spirit. They were even filing lawsuits against each other. Yeah, that was some crazy stuff that Paul was having to deal with. These issues, and even issues of theology, were causing a division in the church in Corinth. And Paul writes, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Now, William Barclay, in his commentary, suggests that this could be translated to say that I, Paul, follow Christ, while all you are following all of these other people, Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, and that ultimately we all should be followers of Christ. Then Paul goes on, he says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so Paul chastises those in the Corinthian church who would divide over who happened to be evangelized, who, who would happen to evangelize them, or whose theology they ascribe to. Meanwhile, there is only one person for us to follow. There's only one, Jesus Christ, as presented to us in the Gospels, who told us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, and that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that in seeking, we will find, and through God's grace, when we have faith in Christ, that we will be saved. The rest is all, pardon my Greek, adiaphora, which means not that important. So Paul encourages them to set aside their differences. He tells them in verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you. In other words, 
Folks, let's agree that Christ is what is important, and let's move ahead on that basis. Last week on the calendar was the week of prayer for Christian unity. And there was a service at the UCC church on Wednesday. Robin and I went. I did a reading and led some prayers. Other pastors from the area participated as well. And there was a sense of togetherness there. Yet truthfully, the participation of all of the churches in the community. There's 51 churches in this area. There were like four churches <laughs> that participated in this event. And so there are still divisions among denominations. Some refuse even to work with other ones. There are two ministerial associations in town, and I belong to both of them. <laughs> and there are church blocks within the community. And that's just to let you know how much division there is in Alpena itself. There are even sometimes divisions in individual churches. And of course, our church is no exception. Sometimes that we have these uh, little squabbles among ourselves. We are fallible humans after all. But I must say that a little bit of that is actually healthy. And as long as we all come to agreement at the end of an issue or a project, or at least agree to disagree, I think that we uh, will succeed if we do <coughs> that at least. And that we do do that. And I think we all do that. And as long as we stick to the golden rule, as long as we give each other the benefit of the doubt, as long as we remember our vision to proclaim and nurture and demonstrate, I think we will stay unified as a church and we'll find a way to move ahead. So what is the big deal about unity? Why is Paul so adamant on this issue? Now, when I was in the Navy, uh, when I first started, they put you in this class called Officer Candidate School. And uh, we were divvied up into, uh, first we had a regiment and we had a company, and the company was divided into squads, and the squad was about six people. Well, one day when we were in the barracks, an instructor came in and, and uh, said, oh, I want Alpha Company, uh, I, and I want Squad One. And that's what, that was the squad I was, I was lucky to be the first person to experience this in our company, or one of the first persons. So six of us were marched down, the street with our instructor, and we're brought to this big building. They open this door, we go in there, and then it says Damage Control Training Center on the door. And I go in there, and then there's this, that's kind of hard to explain, so pay close attention, is there's this, this steel box. It's about 12 by 12 and about 8 feet tall, and it's sitting in the floor in water surrounding the entire thing. And all there is is a hatch on top. And the instructor says, okay, yeah, Alpha Company, squad, one, down that, down that hatch. So we go down that hatch, and we're standing down there, and I'm looking around, and you know, there's a blanket here, there's just this wedge-looking piece of wood there, and there's two-by-fours on the floor, and everything's just kind of damp and, and, and yucky. There's pieces of rubber and these clamps, and and uh, then we were looking around, and uh, we start hearing this noise, and there's this hole in the bulkhead on the side, and a hole in a pipe going over our head, and a couple other holes here and there, and suddenly, water starts spurting through all of these holes. And we're all looking around before we even can figure out what to do. You know, the water is up to our ankles. And it's like we're all looking around. Well, we see where the big water is coming from, and we suddenly realize this is an exercise. They just didn't tell us it was coming. <laughs> so uh, one of us picks up, uh, you know, that uh, that wedge and tries to shove it in that hole. We're all pushing that, trying to cover up, because that's where the main water is coming from, right? Well, it didn't take long. We never did get even that hole plugged. And before you do it, we had water up to here, up to our chest. And about that time, you hear this squeak, 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 and the water turns on. <laughs> and uh, the instructors, we look up through the hatch, and there's the instructor up there just laughing at us. And he says, OK, folks, up and out of there, back to your barracks, clean yourselves up. So marching back the whole way with our had just been freshly polished shoes, we're going squack, 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 walking along that, that, uh, 
as we went back to the barracks. So we got back and we were all like, oh, we failed that exercise, now what? And uh, so we were all kind of dispirited and, and, and whatever. And, and uh, so the next day, right about the same time, that same instructor shows up. Well, what were the chances of that happening? So we march back down there, we're back down in that, in that chamber again, but we all know what's coming. <laughs> so we, we just, we went to work, you know, as soon as we got down there, but we weren't coordinated. I mean, we're all going for this big uh, hole, and a couple of us, you know, maybe for that pipe that's over our head, and uh, it wasn't long before the water was back up to our chest again. So out we go, fail the exercise again, march back to the barracks, okay, now, well, it's happened to us twice, probably going to happen again, right? <laughs> so we all got together that evening, and we said, okay, you know, Joe and Mary, you put the plug in the wall. Oh, first we, we realized that you need to put the blanket up first and then shove the, shove the plug in the wall because that would get all the extra little cracks that were around. And, and uh, so two people then were assigned to one person to hold uh, the rubber over the, the busted pipe and then put the put the straps around it and tighten them up, and that would stop that stop the flow of water there. Another crack was behind the pipe, and there was those two by fours on the floor with rubber. So we assigned somebody else. So there's six of us, so we gave everybody a job. That last person was to put that piece of rubber up there and then jam a two by four in there and hold it. So the next day, you know, the instructor shows up and we're thinking, hey, we got this covered, right? So we march down there, down the hatch, and uh, turn on the water and just like clockwork, everyone did their job. And you know what? Our shoes still got wet, but that was the worst of it. And we passed the exercise. And I thought that was an important lesson for all of us, not only learning how to stop water flow when a ship is going down, <laughs> but also how to work together. And, and, and that's an important lesson I think we can learn from that. <clears throat> Now, this was only an exercise, and the compartment only sank until the water was up to our chest. But we sure got a good soaking when we were not successful. And we were only successful after we understood what our goal was, which was to keep from sinking in the first place. And then we understood what it was that we needed to do, which was to patch the holes of the materials that we had at hand. And we had some measurable indicators of success, right? Well, you know, when that water got up to our chest, we knew we had been. <laughs> water rising up, that's a bad thing. <coughs> and we met together to make ourselves accountable, you know, for what we were doing and giving everybody a job to do. So we had to work together, and everyone was helping to accomplish the goal. And you know, I think what happened there in that training exercise back in my Navy days is not dissimilar to what's happening today to the mainline churches in general and to the Presbyterian church in particular. Are we as a denomination sinking? I would say that in a sense we are, well, at least the numbers in the denomination continue to go down. In fact, the Presbyterian Church USA has been declining in numbers for decades. And our church has actually been part of that decline. Now my own belief is that the decline is partly due to division in the wider church and the difficulty we find in coming up with a co coordinated effort. But I think it's even more fundamental than that. I think we've been afraid to access some of our powerful resources that we have at our disposal. In our own church alone, we have a vast amount of experience and talent. We have leaders sitting right there in the pews who can be trusted to do great things, and we don't have to micromanage them. We have a beautiful facility that is underutilized. We have financial resources that we could judiciously apply. We are our Presbyterians after all, so whenever financial resources are applied, it is done judiciously. <laughs> We have God the Father to appeal to. We have Christ as our example. And we have the Spirit to energize us, to help us move forward. You know, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, Christ gives a mandate to the apostles. He tells them to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Following
find this great commission, I believe that we can grow this church. Session and the deacons will be working with me in the coming days, finding ways to bring more disciples to Christ through the activities of the church. Growing will not be easy. I'm giving you that warning right now. It will mean a lot of work and much reliance on the Spirit. At times we will be discouraged, but at other times we will be uplifted. It will mean change here and there. And none of us likes to be taken out of our comfort zone, do we? Yet I believe if we try new things while continuing to do the things that we do well, if we follow our vision statement to proclaim God's word, to nurture God's people, and to demonstrate God's love, working together with God's help, we will succeed. Let us pray. Blessed and holy God, you are three in one, the very image and model of how we should be with each other. Lord, infuse us with your spirit that we might know joy and fellowship with one another that we might work amicably with one another, spurring each other on to new levels of dedication to you. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.